If you haven't experienced it in person, you've probably seen clips of people speaking in unknown languages or tongues in these charismatic or Pentecostalist congregations. What you may not know is there has been research that explains this phenomenon on a scientific level. In the Christian tradition, the practice is in reference to the apostles receiving the gift of tongues at Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2 verse 4, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it each of us hears them in our native language? This seems a little bit different than what we see when people speak in tongues in these YouTube clips or in these documentaries, because no one can understand these unknown languages. So let me explain. What is being described in Acts 2 is sometimes called xenoglossia. Xenoglossia is described as speaking in a foreign language that is not known to the speaker. For example, there's this claim by exorcists that the demons will sometimes speak through the possessed in foreign languages. Glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, is described as utterances approximating words and speech, usually produced during states of intense religious experiences. Some participants in these movements will simply claim that it's not random gibberish, because maybe you need a translator or a speaker that will translate this message of God from the gibberish. However, research was done in the 70s by William Samarin, a linguist analyzing various languages of speakers of glossolalia in different countries. In his book, Tongues of Men and Angels, he writes, It is verbal behavior that consists of using a certain number of consonants and vowels and a limited number of syllables that in turn are organized into larger units that are then taken apart and rearranged with variations in pitch, volume, speed, and intensity. So what he's saying essentially is it's gibberish. Samarin further found that each particular glossolalist will only speak in gibberish that is from that speaker's native language. In a published journal article, he wrote, Glossolalia consists of strings of syllables made up of sounds taken from all those that the speaker knows. In another article, he further confirms this idea. Glossolalia is nothing more than the reduction of one's native language to its phonological component. Another linguist, Heather Caven, who spent 500 hours of fieldwork studying New Zealand Christian glossolalists, found something similar in her research. She writes that many of her samples that she took while studying Christian glossolalia in New Zealand shared phrases with tiki, which is common in Maori. And in cases where tongues were being translated by an interpreter to prophecy, Samarin found that most of the time writing down glossolalia had no meaning, because the meaning was in the present experience itself, and not the literal phrases that were being spoken. So here's the other thing. There are practices of glossolalia in non-Christian contexts around the world. For example, the Dayaks of Borneo, or medicine men, will chant words that are unknowable to laymen. Shaman in South America and the Aborigines in Australia, when under spirit possession, will vocalize mumbling, gurgling, and groaning. In Sudan, the Dinka people are known to repeat ecstatic utterances during spirit possession. There are these bursts of frenzied movement, which then are preceded by these quieter behaviors in which possessed would sing snatched songs that no one can understand. Additionally, Caven found that there are occasions of glossolalia found in Eastern meditation practices like Kundalini Yoga, Qi Gong, and Sant Mat. The overlapping beliefs in each of these practices is that the participants receive spiritual energy or have their own spiritual energy activated. Caven found that participants may experience Kriyas or manifestations which would be like shaking, weeping, laughing, howling, upsurges of memories, and occasionally glossolalia. Participants in these activities believe that these kriyas will help purify them. In general, glossolalia seems like this self-induced hypnotic or dissociative-like effect. And there are these like instructions that Samarin highlights in his research that 
they can be used to induce this effect. In his book, he writes, The most common advice to give to seekers was to speak whatever comes to you. This counsel is meant to reduce inhibitions. The seeker already has been taught that these utterances are God-given, regardless of how they may sound. Once this has happened, some people at least are on their way to talking in tongues. For others, there is much more to do. It is not uncommon for the teacher to make some allusion to child speech. One of Samaritan's respondents was told to just begin to praise God in sounds that were syllables that were not in English, as you might make loving sounds to a baby. In childhood, one pretended to talk a language. Now, in the spirit, it is real. The leader will ask, close your eyes and just begin to talk. Just lift up your heads and talk to Jesus, standing right there listening to you. Don't talk English. Stop praying. Stop begging. Stop pleading. Let your tongue flip. Your tongue will be taken over by the Spirit. He warns them that their speech will sound funny and childish, but that unless you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom. He anticipates that some will stammer and stutter. He tells them that they may feel a trembling in their body. This is the Holy Spirit nudging them. In one case, Samarin highlights in his book, three days previously, I had asked Jesus to baptize me in the Holy Spirit out loud by myself. Nothing appeared to happen, but on this night I was completely relaxed in my favorite place to relax, and I was quietly praying and praising God in English, when suddenly I realized I was not speaking English anymore, but a language unknown to me. And then there are many cases and testimonies on the internet where they just faked it until they made it. Which is where the self-induced hypnosis seems to come into play. In many cases, it just seems like letting go. And researchers at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine have discovered this decreased activity in the frontal lobes in the area of the brain associated with being in control of oneself during glossolalia. The researchers found that the subjects were not in control of the usual language centers during this activity and there were increases in emotional areas of the brain, like the right amygdala. So what is the motivation and reasoning behind speaking in tongues? Well, some people believe that because of the restrictive culture of some Christian sects, that the resolution that comes from speaking in tongues is in direct opposition to most of their curated, restrictive lifestyle. It creates this cathartic safe space and outlet to just let it all go. It's relieving all of that inner tension in a space with other like-minded people. Another study found that there was a reduction in cortisol being under the influence of tongues, which may suggest the motivation for the activity, which is stress reduction. Couple that with the collective bonding of attending communal services like a weekly church service, it makes sense why someone might be drawn to these rituals. In conclusion, Glossolalia, or speaking in tongues, seems to occur under some sort of self-hypnosis, and there is evidence that glossolalists speak in tongues based on words or phrases that are inherent to their native language, and not based on unknown supernatural languages. It is a global phenomenon, regardless of religion, manifesting in similar ways around the world, with possible motivating cathartic benefits when done by a willing participant. Thank you for watching. If you liked the video, hit the like button. And if you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel. Thanks.